Listen, you, if you came for extra hope, can I give you some? Would that be all right? Uh, we, uh, we look Sunday. It, it, it is, it, in, in our season of hope, week two, uh, it, it purpose. This idea of, of purpose uh, and hope intersecting. And the reality is that in the coming of Christ and in the, really the events surrounding the coming of Jesus, we do very clearly find that God had a purpose and he was weaving that throughout the circumstances, the narrative that we have in the gospel. When we talk about uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and specifically we have a whole lot more about the birth of Jesus in Matthew and in Luke. And we have different aspects of those, right? You have uh, genealogies that reflect mom's side or, or dad's side. You have uh, Matthew's account, who, uh, gospel account, and then you have Luke's gospel account. Some of the things are the same, and some of them are just different views um, of, of different instances, right? So it's cool to hear when the angel came to speak to, uh, to Mary or even John the Baptist, uh, mom and dad, and Elizabeth and Zachariah. But the point being, all these different scenarios, it wasn't like God was just doing a single thing. Like one thing was being accomplished. And we learned Sunday that, that many times when we cannot understand what it is God's doing, like we looked at Mary and Joseph, you remember this, right? And if you don't, it's okay, I'm going to re rehearse just a moment uh, to fill you in. Mary and Joseph were doing life. They were getting ready to be married. They had a plan. They thought they were following God's plan. They thought they were doing it his way. But in the middle of them trying to do what they thought God wanted them to do, Jesus interrupted their plans. And if you remember what we said, how dare God step into their plans and decide he was in charge? And when I say that, you're like, oh. and yet we so oftentimes get frustrated. Don't, does anybody else get frustrated when what you had planned, the way you wanted it to be, the month you wanted it to be done, the way that you wanted it to be done, it didn't happen that way? Like, like if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm just kind of mentioning some stuff, Mark, you're in, Mercer, you're in the room, you help, you're the architect that helped us with this back space. We opened it two months before the hurricane. And when the hurricane hit, it ripped part of the roof. We read, did, we had to, I was kind of upset. Anybody else upset? Um, I mean, they ripped a bunch of stuff. I mean, it did. It's like, God, what did I miss? Like, and, and we've used this space. It's been so good for us in so many different ways. But I was a little bit agitated. And I can see some of the things he was doing in that plan. You can see some of the things God was doing in a plan in your life along the way. But if we're just being, if we're being real instead of just trying to put on a facade and say, look, if you trust Jesus, everything's easy. If you trust Jesus, then after you've, you place your hope in Christ, it's all going to go your way. You will always get a parking spot at the front. Some of you didn't tonight. You dropped your kids off. You're like, man, it was so busy. I didn't know where to put them. It's all I could do to get here. It was hectic. I mean, can God really be in the middle of all this? I promise you the sacrifice you're making is worth it. And just because it's a busy parking space does not mean uh, God doesn't want you here, right? And so we have this tendency to ask this question, which is the opposite of the question that I think God wants us to ask. We always are saying, what about me? And when I say that, it's almost a turn off to hear that. Like, well, what's wrong with asking what about me? I'm not sure that the question itself is bad, but I think the problem is that it's usually the first question we're asking. And, in, and the difficulty is when you look at Mary and Joseph, they were, they were, it looks like they were doing it right. But even in the middle of all of it, God had brought them to, to just the place they needed to be. That shocked, it blew everybody else's mind. He brought them to just the place they needed to be. He gave them just as much of what they needed to know as he wanted them to know. You know, I, 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 sometimes I quote my predecessor a lot more than at other times. I don't know why I talked to him this week, and maybe, maybe that's why it's just kind of close inside. But one of the things that he used to tell me, I hadn't heard this in quite a while. Bill Montgomery is his name. But what he, used to, he used to talk about something called progressive revelation. Now, I don't know what the technical definition is of all that, but what I do know, and, and it's not some kind of thing where it's like, well, I'm, I'm only going to tell you what I want you to No, 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 no. There's a lot I don't know. And, and so we're going we're gonna to do what we know, and then when we get to the end of what we, what we know, guess what's going to happen? I don't know how. I don't know what it's going to look like. God will open a door. He'll show us what the next step looks like. So when you look at Mary and Joseph, they were honoring God, and God stepped in and said, hey, look here. You're going to have a baby. It's going to be the Son of God. Yeah, I know all your family's going to get mad, and they're going to make all kind of accusations, and the, the whole town really is going to just talk about you. I get it. But, but, but all that being what it is, I'm doing it my way, God said, right? And so, Mary, you're blessed. You're highly favored. Y'all going to go do this thing. You're going to go to Bethlehem. While you're doing taxes, you're going to be in the, you're going to pay your taxes. It's then that I'm going to let you. That's, I'm going to call that as the time. When they don't have any room in the end, I'm going to make that the time that you have the baby, right? And then you're going to run for your life because uh, this other guy's wanting to kill the, the, next, the next king. And you're like, I don't think any of that makes sense. He showed them just what they needed to know. 
to get just to the next step. And some of you, I mean, I'm just being honest with you. Some of you here tonight, you're like, I don't know what it's going to look like in 2022. Like at my house, in my relationships, um, with my kids, with my health, I don't know what next. Can I just tell you, neither did Mary and Joseph. They took one step at a time, and they trusted God by faith. And if there was ever a time in our life that we thought that, 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 there, that, that God intended for us to always know what the end road looks like, we know where we're headed, but there's so many details in that, right? What I promised you, again, I'm re- a lot of this is rehearsal of what we've already done. You can go into the Gospel of Luke, and you can look at the story of Mary and Joseph. It really, we'll, we're going to dig Sunday. I'm giving the promo for Sunday or the teaser. I was supposed to do a video. I hadn't done it yet, right? So you'll know what's coming. Emmanuel, God with us. And so it's this notion that, okay, I'm trusting him each step of the way, but the whole beauty of Jesus coming is it was God's promise that he walks with us even when we can't see it. Like in, in the, the, the era that we're living in, the Holy Spirit's with us. That's the promise. Now, forever, as a believer in Jesus Christ, God's promise is to be with me every breath I take, and then just whatever that split second is between he's walking me to the other side, and then I'm seeing him face to face. That's a pretty stinking good promise, I think. And so that's the hope we're looking at this coming week. But what you, what you got to see here is that um, Mary and Joseph aren't the first people whose plans got blown up. You know, it would be easy enough to say, okay, well, that was just them. What about all those other people that, you know, they get all those messages about it being easy, and if I pray hard enough and have enough faith, I'm, I'm going to get well. I mean, you should pray, and you should have faith, and God can't heal you. But you got to leave room for God to be God. Right? you got to leave permission. And so you, you, when you look at the, the totality of the Bible, you have all these other stories of how God used these weird ways to accomplish his purpose. And what we may call weird wasn't weird at all to God. It was his plan. It's his providence. It's his working it out. I mean, think about Moses, right? I mean, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Then we're going to actually dig into a Christmas passage. Uh, but, but, but think about Moses. You say, well, okay, we in the wilderness? No, 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 this was way before the wilderness. This is part of the, the, the providence of God. They were killing babies back then. All the Hebrew babies, were they, were they were saying, okay, you can't have any Hebrew boys. We're gonna, they're, they're not allowed to have those. And so you remember the story? Some of y'all remember this from preschool, maybe? That's why y'all read kids preschool. Uh, they didn't talk about killing babies. But they did talk about little Moses being put in a little basket. Remember the crocodiles? No, I don't know anything about crocodiles. They were there in the picture. They had to have been crocodiles. Uh, and so they made the, they made the little and, and they, they didn't want to kill him. So they, they put him out in the, in the river. And guess what? He floated. Somehow the Pharaoh's daughter found him. He got saved. They got the whole thing. Long story. Later on, God was preparing a deliverer for Egypt, I mean, for, for, for Israel from Egypt. And, and then you have all this other providence of God that takes place after that. And you just read that whole story, and you're like, okay, there's the providence, there's the providence, there it is again, there it is again. Now, it looks great to us. It looks like a storybook. Like, oh, this is like a fairy tale, man. It just kind of starts off bad, and then it gets down, and it looks like there's hope, and then it crashes, but then it just, whoo, it's great, happily ever after. Except when you're living a fairy tale. Because when you're living in the fairy tale, you're like, it's over. There's no hope. It's never going to be okay. Well, the fact of the matter is that if you were Moses or Moses' mama, I mean, what you, you're just taking one step by faith and you're trusting God. You're taking one step by faith and you're trusting God. If you look at Joseph, you find the same thing. I mean, I don't know how many years before Moses figured out what God had in mind. I'm not even sure if it, if it was totally clear to him. Uh, before right up until the end. He didn't get it right every time, by the way. He had some, hurt, some tough hurdles. And then, and then you, look at, you look at somebody like, jo- I mean, what, 30, 40 years in Joseph's life? Maybe more? His whole teenage years were just a mess. Arrogant little snot, best I can tell. I don't know if I can say that. I guess I can. I'm mostly adults in here. Um, I mean, he was. I mean, he was full of himself, and he didn't get a dream that would tell him he was that much more important. And he'd go tell everybody about his dream. I'm going to be in charge. I dreamt it. It's going to happen. Well, then they traded him away, sold him into slavery. Like, well, what was that about, God? You told me I was. Well, then he, he rose up, and then it's up and down. Eventually, he, and I preached on this, but eventually he was able to see God's hand in all of it. Eventually, his brothers saw God's hand in all of it. But there will also be some things you won't see God's hand in before, before your life is done. And so this picture that we've gotten to is this idea that you are a part of God's story, but you are, you, God, God is with you, God cares about you, the what about you is that you are extremely special to God and he has a plan and he's going to walk with you through all of it, but you are a small part of what God's doing. And too often we think we're the central part of what God is doing. You're not. 
I'm not. That's hard to hear. Somebody else, somewhere else might tell you something different than that. I'm telling you, that's, that's the truth. I mean, you, you, are, you, you matter so much to God, but you are, you are not the only part. It'd be like the head coach telling you that, hey, you're the quarterback because you're the quarterback uh, at this team and at this time, you're the man. Well, there's a couple of programs in this country, and I'm not going to name them because you're going to get all, start giving me all this Roll Tide stuff and, 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 and whatnot, right? Uh, but here's the reality. Um, you ain't, if, if you are the quarterback at said school, you ain't the first one. You're one in a long history that have borne that name, that have worn that tag that identifies you, maybe honorably so, as a part of that program. But can I just tell you, as a Christian and as a child of God, one who he loves and loves deeply and dearly, you're not the first and you're not going to be the last. And it doesn't mean you're lesser, but it does mean you're part of something that's bigger than you. And the bigger than you thing that God has created, man, it matters. And if the question that we're asking is, what about me? Man, you're, you're messing up the team. Like, like I'm not saying, the, I'm saying like God's got a plan. And, and if, if we're not looking at life with purpose, like you see the purpose, like that quarterback plays a role in that point, not just in history, but like he's got a, a thing that he's supposed to accomplish. What we saw Sunday, Ephesians 2.10, he created you new in Christ. You are his workmanship. And there's a list of things he's got for you to be about. It says that he's created them specifically for you. And so, yes, you are a part of this. You remember W.A. Criswell? Some of you don't have a clue I'm talking about. Here's the concept. Crimson thread that runs all the way through the scriptures from cover to cover. Like early in Genesis, we start seeing the, the beginning pictures of a need for a, a Messiah, right? But Jesus was there, by the way, back at the beginning. I don't want to confuse you, but, 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 but the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And, and, and that thread runs all the way through to the other end of Revelation. You say, how's it a Revelation? Because Jesus, in that fulfillment, went and cr- made a place for us, right? New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Uh, and we'll be, those of the chosen Christ will be with him in the by and by. The crimson thread runs all the way through the whole deal. Here's the crazy part. Between where the last book of the New Testament that was written, like timeline that was written, and I'm not even gonna, I, 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 I'm not going to identify, there's some debate on some of it, but like whether it was the, the, the letter that he wrote to the church at Corinth or to the church at Rome or the church at Philippi, he's written all these guys' instructions. And then you got John, right, who was given the, the revelation, the picture of how things would end, but you got all that space between this, when his first generation of disciples lived and spoke forth the word of God and how we should do life and the very end. The thread that runs between those two It's you and me. Because we're not at Revelation yet. Some of you think, well, we're real close. Maybe we're parts of it, but it isn't done yet. And everything I've read about what to do between now and then says be faithful, do business till I come, live as though, uh, and encourage one another uh, so much the more as the day is approaching. Like, we're supposed to be for Christ. So we're still living as part of that. What does that mean? That means it's almost like you're Mary and Joseph. I'm not saying you're having the Messiah. I'm saying God's got a plan And Jesus may intersect with your life, and when he does, it's the cross. It's the intersection between hope and purpose. You say, well, why should that give me hope that he has a purpose and that I'm supposed to live it out? Candidly? It's because he's got something specific for you to be about. Do you think he's not going to allow you to accomplish that if he planned it? Do you think he doesn't want that to occur? It says that his plans for us are beyond our wildest imagination. It doesn't say exactly like that. In fact, Ephesians 3.20 says that it's super abundantly beyond all that we can imagine or think. That's what he's created for us. That's the same chapter, or a different chapter, same book that says that he's created these works for us. So what I'm saying to you is that the question should, should not be, what about me? The question should be, Lord, what about you? What would you have me do? If you ask him that in frustration, he's not going to turn his face to you. He won't. So, some of you are like, okay, well, where's the scripture at? I've given you several, but let's just go to text, okay? In Luke, still in Luke, but we're in Luke chapter 2. I'm going to give you, really, it's two examples. I'm going to focus on one more than the other. Two folks that are advanced in age. We can call the man old. Can't we call men old? This is an old man, and y'all don't think that's nice? Sorry. And a woman that was well advanced in years. Um, And... (laughs) And, and listen, tough things happen earlier in life, too. We've already looked kind of at that, though, to some degree with, uh, with Mary. We looked a little bit at Ruth Sunday. Great, I mean, great biblical examples of this. But the Bible tells us 
in Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to, look, y'all are a Wednesday night crowd. Y'all don't mind me reading you a little bit. I'll explain some as we go, but there were certain things once they had Jesus that needed to be done, and one of those was bringing him to the, to the temple for the purification. It says, when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. If you know anything else about the rest of the, the journey Jesus was on, he fulfilled everything that was needed according to the, to, to the prophets and according to what the law required. That was a part of what Jesus was about. It's part of why when he got to the end, he said, Lord, I've, come, I've fulfilled, I've done everything you asked me to do. It's finished. Um, and so this was one of those things. It says it's written in the law of the Lord. Every male that first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Sacri- and a sacrifice should be offered. Oddly enough, the sacrifice that was offered is what poor people would offer. Those that don't have a lamb, they offer uh, pigeons, turtle doves. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. He's the first, he's the old man. And he, uh, this man was righteous. He was devout. And he was waiting on the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it was revealed, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Doesn't tell us a whole lot other about his life except that he'd been waiting to go see the Lord, or t- to die really, until he saw the Messiah. And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, you know, it, it, it had to have been interesting every day to go in there wondering, is today the day? Is today the day? Is today the day? You wonder how many days did he go in there like that? Is it 10 years, 20, 30? Who knows? Could have been any of the above when you hear the other that I'm about to tell you, but um, this was the day. He went into the temple. When he came uh, in there, he... Um, The parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, and he took him up in his arms, and he blessed God, and he said, there's something here, by the way, about him recognizing the Messiah. But he said, look now, you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Can I just tell you, God had had promised him that little peace. God let him see that little peace. That was his part of the thread. It was an after, you think, it, hang on a second. The father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Can I see, can you see, can you see what God's doing? I, I'm stuttering. Can you see what God is doing right here? You've got one event. You've got a man that was a prophet of God that had been promised by God. You wait and see. I'm going to show you the Messiah before you die. You've got a mom and a daddy that were given day by day instructions from God, really moment by moment, of what do we do with this Messiah that, that, that we have been tasked to raise? I mean, you talk about pressure, right? Some of y'all have pressure to be the perfect mom. You don't have to raise your hand, but there's a bunch of you, and I see it. You want to get it just right. Well, Mary had pressure. You think Mary wasn't looking for an affirmation that all this stuff she wasn't, like that somehow she hadn't missed it all? Let me tell you, the people of God through history have needed affirmation at times, and God, and I know I almost sound Pentecostal saying this. I, I don't make sure I can fully describe what I'm what I'm saying to you except God has a way of showing us a thing in a moment and we're like man there's no way that that could have happened but that be God and this is what we see I've already shown you some of that with with Mary seeing Elizabeth yes God saw fit that Elizabeth in her old age would bear a child when she shouldn't have born a child but he saw fit that Mary would get to know that Elizabeth who shouldn't have born a child right was having the forerunner of her Messiah that she was having like oh well maybe it is true because if she's having a baby then maybe maybe it's possible that I am having the Messiah and so now here later at the dedication what we're finding right is Simeon is affirming for Mary and Joseph your child is a light of salvation so yes God fulfilled the promise in Simeon and at the same time he was affirming and encouraging and shining a light for Joseph and for Mary it's that scarlet thread they marveled at what was said about him Simeon blessed them and said to his mother behold this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Well, it sounds like he's telling her it might be tough. I think she's already figured that out if they've been running for their life a little bit. You know what I mean? So, so it's, it's an affirmation. Or I told you I wasn't going to hang out there too long. Um, but then it says, this is the second one, this is Anna. There was a prophetess named Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years. The Bible said it, not me. I ain't call her old. Having lived with her husband for seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. 
whatever age it was she got married, which probably was young, she, she got to be with her husband for seven years, and after he died, from then on, was a widow. And now she's 84. I'm just reading the text and telling you what we see. She was a widow for a long time. A long time. And you remember we talked Sunday about how long, you know, the process of this. You know, how long did it take Mary to re regroup after realizing that her plans that were for God and, you know, as best she knew, were blown up. Now she has to process it. Well, now you got a sweet lady here who had been married for a number of years, husband died, and now she spends most of her life as a widow. What did she do in that time? It says that she did not depart from the temple worshiping by, with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. You're like, man, she was a saint. Can I just tell you, she, she was just trusting God day after day after day after day. And do I think God gave her strength and provision each day? Absolutely. We have no reason to believe any different. Did it take a long, long, long time before she was able to see the Messiah for herself? It did. But here's where it connects back to where we are. In the middle of all this, she, at that hour, began to give thanks to God and speak of him to all who were waiting on the redemption of Jerusalem. Here's where it connects, guys. The part that we play, yeah, is it working in your life in some way? Yes, there are dark moments and there are brighter moments. There are harder days and there are easier days. But when we get it like he intended for it to be, according to the word, we're able to worship God and to praise God. But she's telling everybody, hey, guys, listen, y'all are waiting on the consolation, what did it say, the consolation, the redemption of Jerusalem. Some of you, I mean, can we just be real? I mean, we're just, y'all come in here from all kind of different, uh, I don't want to say levels of faith, but you've been, you're from different places, different backgrounds, different experiences. Some of you have a Bible that's got all kind of notes in it. Uh, and some of you may not even have one with you, may not even own one. The fact of the matter is that whatever space you come from, God's desire for you is that you would know the hope and choose it and share it. Like he wants you to know Christ and he wants you to share. Like that's, that's the common denominator. The purpose and the hope intersect in that place. You say, well, isn't that a catchy little thing that you've been, yeah, it is. But how, how is what, you, you can say, well, what about me? And what about the economy? And what about my job? And maybe more importantly, what, what about, I say more importantly, um, whatever the things are that you've been looking at that are happening across the nation or in your life or in your school, what about you? It, you matter. You matter to God. But God has shown over and over and over, he's got a plan. Progressive revelation. It's that old headlight theory. How many of you heard me talk about the headlight theory? It's not mine. I got it from my father-in-law a bunch of years back. You ever ridden in the dark with headlights? They don't shine very far. Some of y'all got fancy ones. They shine a long way. Nobody can see. They're always flicking their lights at you. They usually flick. I, maybe I need to get mine in line. They always flick their lights at me. And I'm like, then I hit them, hit them with my uh, high beams. I'm like, don't flick your lights. At me. I'm, I'm good. You don't want that. Uh, but you, you still can't. I, that's not nice, is it? I'm just trying to let them know. It's all. I just, they, they, I, I, I'm good. Um, so, sorry. I'm human. Um, did I lose you? Hang with me. You can only see as far as the light shines. What happens when you get to where you're the end of the, where the light was shining? You see just a little bit further. You see just a little bit further. Progressive revelation, that's a concept. Don't lose your hope. God is at work. He's been at work before you were born. We've already learned this. You can you go read Psalm 139 again. What's dark to you is not dark to God. He planned your days from one to the end. You were knitted together in your mother's womb. He planned out all your days. He knows when your last one is. That means God's on the throne and God's in charge. And he's given you an option today to choose to believe what he's promised you is the fact. He wants to do it. He's got a list of things he wants you to be about. Don't, I, 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 it, it's hard not to fret. I fret some days. I'm naturally built that way, I think, to worry about things down the road. God says to us, trust me. If there's anything that I'm learning in these kind of times, we are used to being able to, to, to have lots of resources, lots of uh, either finances, intelligence, people that we know. I mean, this is Bay County, right? You know people, you know people that do things, they can get things done. 
I'm going to tell you something. After the hurricane, how many of you could find a contractor on day one and get it done that day? I mean, if you could even get a phone call returned, it was great. Even if you did, could you get the shingles? Could you get, could you get it? it? I mean, I'm, we've learned some things. We've learned that there's sometimes that God pulls control away from us, and we have to acknowledge that we're not in charge. The good news is, he still is. He's in charge of the light, and he's in charge of the darkness. And you, I don't know that I've ever quite seen it this way before, but it's just, man, it's, it's true gospel. You are part of his, as a Christian, crimson thread in that blessed time. Like, we're living in a blessed time. Can I make y'all say that? It's all right. A blessed time. Say a blessed time. No, you don't mean it. A blessed time. Say it one more time real nice. I'll pray real quick, okay? A blessed time. You were laughing. A blessed time. See, it's repetition. It's like, if we, it's like writing the sentences on the wall. If you tell yourself it's awful long enough, you're going to start thinking it's awful. You say, well, it is awful. No, it's not. I just told you you're blessed. You're, you're living in a time that God's doing a thing. He's doing a thing, and he's chosen you to do it. You've been built for it. So you can't see to the end? That's all right. Walk till you get to the end of where you can see by faith. And trust God to show you what the step is after that. Choose hope and share hope. Guys, we're trying to, sh- we're trying to change the conversation, particularly for believers in Bay County, because we have the blessed hope. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all these fine folks that came to watch grandbabies and stayed to hear me open the word. Lord, I, we do trust your word. And Father, we are grateful that you are, um, we're grateful that you are in charge and that we don't have to be and that we have not just hope, we got extra hope. Thank you for using us to do your will and in the process of using us to accomplish your plans, you are blessing us and showing your love in our life. Lord, help us to change that conversation in this community and be like Anna. As we pray and trust you, Father, I pray that you would help us to be able to declare the Messiah to all that would hear. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.